So we're going to cover some complicated information today. So if you're that type that likes to study in the Bible, then today will be your day. All right, so we're going to cover some uh, complicated, complicated areas today. <clears throat> Let's look at Genesis chapter 15. Uh, I'll review verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. If you recall what I have explained to you last time, is that Abram did not even explain to God his fears, but God knew. So because God knew, he just told him, Fear not, and gave him comfort. And the reason why Abram doesn't have to fear <clears throat> is based on three things in this verse. One is because God already understands him and knows him. So because God already knew Abram, that's why he said, fear not. That was proven at chapter 15, the verse, first half of verse 1. The second point was proven because he is Abram's shield. Meaning that he doesn't have to fear because why? He has to hold on to his faith and believe that God has everything under control even his thoughts and knew exactly what Abram was thinking. So his faith is holding on to God, and that's what deflects the arrows of the enemy. The third thing is because he doesn't have to fear. Why? God is his exceeding great reward. Not just he blesses Abram, but exceeding abundantly, even above that he can ever ask or think. And that is proven in every one of you who experienced Amen. hardship and pain and detrimental situations where you thought it was the end, but God intervened. So this verse is probably uh, the most favorite of mine in last week's Bible study, and I hope you recall that. All right, verse 2. Now let's get down to the hard stuff today. And Abram said, so Abram is speaking, and again, I'm explaining each and every word from the verse so that you can understand each and every word. That way you don't have to think the Bible is too hard to understand. So if I'm repetitive, uh, don't take it as a repetition or, oh, it's something I, re I already know. Don't, no, don't think it that way. You try to explain every word and understand every word yourself, okay? And there's a good chance that you might not, so then when you hear my explanation, it'll already match, okay? All right, Abram speaking, what? Lord God, what wilt thou give me? seeing I go childless. So he's addressing to the Lord God, and he says, what are you going to give to me? Because I don't have a child. You see that I don't have a child. And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. So the only person that's left to take care of his estate, his possessions, is the steward of his house. And that's Eliezer of Damascus. So the steward is a very chief or if not the number one position of the servants or the slaves in a master's home. So Eliezer from Damascus is the guy in charge. Verse 3, And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed. So Abram is saying, Look. So that's what behold means, right? It's like, look. Uh, you didn't give me any child, so no seed of mine. And lo, one born in mine house, uh, my house is mine heir. So Abram is again saying, look, so lo is another word for like behold. That's why people will go sometimes together, lo and behold, such and such happened, right? Because they're synonymous with each other. So Abram's saying, so look, the person that's born in my house is mine heir, meaning Eliezer, he's the steward that was born. So this passage shows Abram's background. He's Syrian. He is not a Jew. He's a Syrian. Why? Eliezer was the one who was born in his household and grown up. So it shows the background of Eliezer, which is Damascus, that Syrian region. So Abram is not a Jew. He is a Syrian. That's important to understand. That's why the Antichrist, he likes to have, the devil likes to have his seed. And he pays very close attention to Syrian Jew. See that? If God does that with his seed, the devil will likely do that too. And you see that example at Daniel chapter 11. But we won't turn over there. That's something that I uh, mentioned so many times. All right. We're going to go to Galatians 4, though. Galatians chapter 4. So this passage demonstrates how 
A child is not in charge, or the firstborn is not in charge of the master's home. It's the steward. Until the firstborn or the son is grown of age, then the steward t- passes over the leadership uh, to the son. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a what? Servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. That's uh, normal even during the, uh, even during I think probably 17, 1800s maybe, maybe before 1800s, but they would have, a, they would have some noblemen would have a tutor or a governess, they would call it. So that's natural within households that servants would be in charge to raise the child or the nobleman's son or daughter rightly. If you look at verse 3, until the time appointed of the father, when the child's become of age, then verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So that's what God demonstrates as us children, we were under bondage. We're, we don't differ from a servant when we were children, but until we're full grown, full of age, and when the father deems it appropriate to turn over to the position, then the son is no longer under the leadership and guide of the steward or the servant. So the steward servant has that priority position, you notice. That's why Abram mentioned Eliezer is the one in charge then. Let's look at verse 4. So basically at verse 2 and 3, Abram is mourning that only his servant will take over his possession. And then verse 4, God says this, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. So Abram says, Behold, at verse 3, but the Holy Spirit responds back, No, you behold, basically. And look, God gave this word to him. What did he say? Saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Meaning that Eliezer will not be his heir. The one that comes forth out of Abraham, uh, Abram's bowels will become his heir. Bowels is referring to empty innard. That's the idea. It's an empty innard. It's, that's why you have a thing like a bowl, for example. The idea is something that's hollow or innard. So some people, they would like to uh, joke or think something disgusting, and some modern versions, they'll put a more uh, disgusting word for it. But the King James Bible is pretty simplified over here. Bowel is basically anything of the innards right here, something of the innards. So from within him, the idea is from within Abraham will come out his son. See, that? that's why bowel is more appropriate rather than putting some kind of disgusting, inappropriate word. And they call themselves Holy Bible, which is, uh, which is ludicrous. Okay, let's look at verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, so God brings Abram out and takes him abroad. So get outside and let me show you something. Uh, just a side note, that's what you can do. You can get out of your cable TV inside your tent, locked up in your room, messing around with your phones and then the internet and video games and whatnot, you can get, uh, what does help you to stop getting in that self-pity notion of verse 1 through 3, that's Abram, right? That self-pity notion, that's what you are. Why don't you try getting out? Let the Lord take you out and then you just observe his creation and that would do wonders. So then that's what God did. He says, okay, he's taking him abroad, outside, letting him look at his creation so he can stop and think for a bit. So you'll notice I drew stars. That's what God did. He takes him outside, shows him the stars. If you keep reading, and said, God is speaking to Abram, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. So God is telling Abram, look up toward heaven. So that's obviously the first heaven right here. And tell the stars. So that, that word tell is referring to count. That's the idea. Uh, how do you know? Because the King James Bible is its own self-dictionary many times. 
You'll notice it says, if thou be able to number them. So tell is referring to numbering. That's why you have in the banks, they'll call it a teller, right? So counting money. So the idea in this English word is referring to counting. God's saying, look toward heaven, all right? Count the stars if you can be able to count them all, number them. Well, obviously, Abram can't, and that would take a long time. That's why God says, and he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So God says to him, that's how, uh, that's how your seed is going to be, your children. It's going to be that numerous, even though Abram mourns that I don't have any child. God's a God of miracles. Now we're going to look at Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. So notice how the scripture demonstrates right here that one of the scientific evidences in your Bible is people cannot count the number of stars. Astronomers today, they'll try to tell you the number of stars, but they can't tell you accurately 100% that is the exact number. Otherwise, NASA would go out of business. The reason why they need that to keep going is so that they can keep trying to search out there in space, and then try to find new life or new heavenly hosts and etc. Well, they're messing, messing with demonic spirits, but that's a separate teaching. I'm not going to get into that. But the point is, is that even scientists admit that this is something that they cannot do. So in spite of the advancement of technology, you'll never be able to count all the number of the stars. So that's one of the scientific evidences in your Bible. So we see that at Genesis 15 and then Jeremiah chapter 33, it goes off with that. Concerning about the seed of David, that it cannot be numbered. That's how numerous the seed of David will be. It's so much in number that you cannot even uh, count them just like the stars of heaven. The verse, uh, we're going to look at verse, let's see right here, 22. Yep. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. So it shows right here that the stars cannot be numbered. Let's go back to Genesis 15. But God, he can count them. God knows. Because he created every single thing, every single entity, substance out there. Let's look at Genesis 15, 6. Abram, what does it say? What does it say? Excuse me. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So notice Abram believed what God said. And because of that, God counted his faith at that moment as his righteousness. So Abram received what is known as imputed, imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. He is a great demonstration of Christians where they receive salvation by faith, through imputed righteousness. Why? Just by, notice right here, there is no works involved. Did you notice that there? There is no works involved. In fact, the law of Moses was not even operating that time. So God just simply took his faith and said, you're automatically uh, counted as righteous. So notice this is a great demonstration and example of Christians who are saved by grace through faith, which is why Paul was able to use this as his argument that there is such a thing as salvation that existed where it was just simply believing and not by works. That's why uh, Paul argued that. He didn't just make up things out of thin air. He, found, he studied the scripture so much that he can find places in the Bible where there are instances of people who didn't work for their salvation or their works failed them, and it was simply by faith for salvation. Now, there are two heresies that I'm going to cover right here. The first heresy is called covenant of grace. For some of you who are not familiar with that, covenant of grace comes from the branch of covenant theology. So there is one teaching that I'm going to debunk here. And that's called covenant theology. But there are two heresies that sprouted out from that. Covenant theology is mostly what you'll find within Calvinist circles. It is a Calvinist teaching. 
It is the enemy camp of dispensationalism. So if you're not a dispensationalist, most likely you'll fall into the camp of covenant theology. Now, there are different other camps, but these are the two main camps within Protestant circles, so to speak. So covenant theology, what they believe is two heresies. One is, like I mentioned before, covenant of grace. In other words, that salvation by grace was ever since the fall of Adam till the millennium starts. So there was no such thing as a different salvation, which Bible-believing dispensationalists disagree with. We believe that there are divided different plans of salvations called dispensational salvations. I'll get to that a little bit later. The second thing is replacement theology. That's been more of the popular term now. There's a different term that Calvinists call it. But the idea is that Abra, Abram's seed is the Christian church, they'll argue. So in other words, the Jews in the current state of the nation of Israel, they are not considered to be Abram's seed, but rather the Christian church, which is heresy. It's heresy, and we totally disagree with that. Now, remember, uh, Calvinists just don't make heresy up. They have scripture. That's important to remember. You cannot teach a convincing heresy without some sort of scriptural evidence. That's very important to understand. So just because someone shows you the Bible doesn't mean, oh, that person is right. The liberals and the agnostics do have a point. When they argue about, you can't just say that the Bible is the truth because you can get so many different interpretations out of it. They do have a legitimate point. Why? Because there's a whole bunch of cults and religions who claim to use the Bible, but let's be honest, they don't agree with each other. They have very, various different interpretations. The fault with the liberal and agnostic side is just because there are many different interpretations doesn't mean there is no true interpretation. See, that's a faulty assumption. Obviously, there's a true interpretation of what the author intended, but I guess the scholastic world wants to pretend that you can never know that yourself and that they're the closest ones who would know unless you're an elitist like them. No, that's not what God intended. He intended for every man and woman to be able to know for himself or herself as long as they study the scriptures. So the point is, in order to avoid heresy, you need to study scripture. I didn't just say scripture. I say study scripture the bible demands study so we have to study the verses and see what's true and false okay so first of all let's cover covenant of grace it is true like i argued before let me know if i'm cut off it is true that as i argued before that covenant of grace they argue and we agree that abram was saved by grace through faith, not by works in this incident right here. However, they overlook something. What they overlook, well, before we come to what they overlook, I guess we should go to their verses. Go to Romans 4, Romans 4 and Galatians 3. Let's establish these pointers before we continue. Romans 4 and Galatians 3. If you go to my verse-by-verse -verse commentary, which is uploaded online, on Galatians, it will also cover this as well. So what I'm speaking to you is pretty much repetition. Let's look at Romans chapter 4. They argue here that Abram was not saved by works, but only by grace through faith. So his salvation is just like the Christian salvation. In Romans chapter 4, what they're going to argue at verse 2 for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And we do say amen to that. We Christians can use Abraham's incident to argue salvation by grace through faith, not by works. But the heresy is promoted by Calvinists and other uh, even independent fundamental Baptists who teach this heresy with Calvinists. That's why they'll condone Calvinist books rather than 
Bible-believing books. They'll sooner promote John MacArthur's book in their own bookstores than Peter Ruckman's. That shows you that's something troubling. Okay, they promote a book where God can pick and choose who goes to heaven and who doesn't go to heaven more than a person who defended his whole life trying to argue that every word in your King James Bible is perfect. They'd sooner pick a book of a Bible corrector. I hope every IFB pastor heard me. All right, so that shows your heart. That's why, you know, when you teach something that some other false group teaches, don't be surprised you'd be closer to them and more distant from Bible believers. And that's a good warning, but I'm not going to part there. In Galatians 3, go over here. Keep your hand at Romans 4. All right, we're going to go back and forth with Romans 4 and Galatians 3. In Galatians 3, this Romans 4 and Galatians 3 is the favorite proof text of heretics to prove these two heresies. Galatians 3, verse 6. Even as Abram, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Uh, let's see, verse 16 and 17 and 18. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, Romans 4 and Galatians 3 are very powerful proof texts. If Paul used it against Judaism, you can use it too. So, notice you can find verses in the Old Testament to prove Christianity. That's important. Uh, Jews from Judaism, they'll argue that it's up to the Old Testament. And if they'll only believe the Old Testament, not the New Testament, then just use Old Testament verses on them. And that's what Paul did. Paul argued that. See, there's no works for salvation. It's by faith. However, there's another extreme, like I told you, of covenant theology. Notice that these verses seem to point out that there's only one seed, not two. There's only one. And that's found in people who are saved by faith, just like Abraham. So thus, we are the real children of Abraham and not the modern Jews today. Now, how do we debunk this? It's very simple. It's called dispensationalism. Okay, first of all, let's go to James 2. James 2. James chapter 2. Now, keep your hand at those uh, passages at Galatians and Romans, all right? We have to go back there. James 2. The simple answer with Abraham is this. Yes, he received salvation like us, not by works, but by faith alone. But you have to understand this. That's, we are dispensationalists. In other words, we divide time periods as well. Yeah. What we argue is that Abram, in this passage, he, is, he received Christian salvation here by faith works. And that's imputed righteousness. However, that's at a time period when he was looking at the stars. But this is what God said about the stars, that his seed would be as numerous as the stars. And then that's separated from a different time period. And that's works. This time period was when he offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. Yeah. And the Bible said that that instant, when he was trying to sacrifice his son, Isaac, yeah. that that was considered works. And by the way, James argued that because this is works, it was adding on top of his faith when he was looking at the stars and believed what God said. That's why James says, faith is not alone. He says, it is true, Abraham had faith 
when he believed what God said about the stars. But James argued, but you can't forget his works later on. And that's why Paul said that Abraham was not saved by works, but by faith alone. And that is true. There is no works involved. It was truly faith alone. But Paul was pointing out in this time period. See, there is no works involved here. It's just believing. All he did was believe. And the Bible says because of that, God automatically counted imputed righteousness. But over here, God called it justified. Or justification. Right. All right, look at James 2. James chapter 2. The Bible reads here at James chapter 2 and verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So James is arguing that faith won't be alone. He argues, yes, there is a faith, but works come out. He says in verse 18, you show the faith by your works. He shows verse 19, just believing is not enough. But remember Romans 4, Paul says believing, that's automatically counted. But look what James says in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works at what time period? When he saw the stars and believed God? When, so he already gave you a time period, he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. See, that's when he was sacrificing his son Isaac. Verse 22, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made what? Perfect. Now look at verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, but he's not done. And... And he was called the what? Friend of God. Why? He was called the friend of God because of verse 21. Verse 21, by that action he did. So that's why it's important to divide time periods. This proves dispensationalism even more. Amen. That you have to divide time periods. Yeah. This doesn't prove covenant theology. It proves the opposite, actually. Yeah. Now, uh, we're going to look at uh, Romans 4, Romans 4. So let me review again. It is true, Galatians 3, Romans 4 argued that Abraham, as the New Testament writers called him, he was not saved by the law, not saved by works, but by faith alone. But the concentration was based on this time period. Why can they argue that way? They can argue that way because if it was salvation uh, by faith and works throughout every single time period in the Old Testament, then Paul wouldn't have proof of salvation by faith alone, not by works. He needs to prove that. And he, how can he prove it biblically? He saw instances, certain time periods, certain moments where God granted salvation by grace through faith, not by works. Why did God do that? It's to build up and to show a picture later on of New Testament salvation by grace. That's why Paul argued right here that Abraham's case illustrates and it pictures about our salvation, New Testament salvation. And that New Testament salvation is not made up. Why is it not made up? Because God did this before. That's the point. God did this before, so why do you doubt God giving it to us now? Well, what makes us different compared to the Old Testament people? The reason, yeah, you got it. The simple answer is because of Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Back then, they didn't have that sacrifice, that ultimate sacrifice. Now that we have it, why can't we say that God's grace this time, absolutely not by works, would be much more longstanding, much more powerful, much more weighty, right? But in the Old Testament, it was not as weighty that time. It was definitely bound by the law. And Galatians 3 actually proved that uh, even though they use Galatians 3, they all ignore Galatians 3.23. Yeah. They ignore that one. That one's pretty evident right there. That faith, salvation by faith under Jesus Christ could not come until the law, see? So it didn't exist that time. Amen. The official New Testament salvation by faith that we got. All right, now Romans 4, the simple debunking to replacement theology is, yes, 
there is one seed, but the idea is this. The idea with this one seed is that it is one seed, but it has two sides. It has two sides to it. Uh, let me know if the board changed its angle, all right? Hopefully it didn't. Okay. So there are two sides with this one seed, like two people in this one seed. Kind of like one God in three persons, right? Such as one book, but it has two testaments, two sides, right? The Bible. See, so that's normal to God. So you can't let them brainwash you. They think they debunk uh, the Old Testament Jews, uh, the Jewish people, national Jews, with spiritual Christians by saying, no, it's just one seed. No, it it works the other way too. Three persons with one God, as well as two testaments in one book, there are two sides to every one coin. See, so they overlook that. There is one seed, but it has two people or two sides. Amen. It has a physical seed and a spiritual seed. Amen. You cannot overlook that. Now, if you deny the physical seed, you're going to have a tough time with that. And then if you deny a spiritual seed, you're going to have a tough time with that. Why? Physical seed is definitely apparent throughout the entire Old Testament. It's from birth. It's from ethnicity. It's from your upbringing. It's not based on a condition of believing and accepting Christ for your salvation. There is no condition. God didn't give a condition to Abraham right here in this passage even. And in Genesis 12, about his physical seed, God didn't give that. But... The spiritual seed, you're, if you overlook that one too, you're going to have a tough time because there's too many New Testament verses, and we just already saw a couple, that Abraham's children is not national Jews in the church age. Abraham's children, for the New Testament spiritual side, is Christians. So Jews can't say, you're not Abraham's children. No, I can tell that Jew, I'm just as much as a Jew as you. <laughs> I can say that, but spiritually speaking, not physically speaking. Okay, you need to prove that, right? Simple. Let's look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Their proof text. You'll notice they did not pay attention to their own proof text. We stuck to their proof text. Look at verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the what? Circumcision only. Look at that. Circumcised physical Jews are uh, Abraham's a father of them, but not just them. Paul acknowledges. Paul acknowledges Abraham is the father of who else? But who also walk in the state steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of what? Faith. See that? So that also includes those saved by faith, the spiritual side. Look at verse 16. 16. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure. The promise is to who? To all the seed. See, one seed, right? But who is this all the seed, one seed? Not to that only which is of the law. Oh, so Paul recognizes Jews who go by the law, see, those physical Jews, that they're considered the seed. But to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. See, those say by faith as well, two sides. Who is the father of what? Us all. Both the physical Jews as well as the spiritual Christians. So this shows a lack of knowledge of dispensationalism from the side of the Calvinists, from the side of those who attack dispensationalism. When they attack dispensationalism, they actually don't really study the passage because if they were really honest and used Romans 4, Galatians 3, they would have found these verses. It shows they weren't paying attention. All right, go to Genesis. Go to Genesis 15. All right, so that's a... Uh, that's the complicated, one of the complicated parts in our Genesis studies. It's that dispensational side. I hope that you learned something important from that. So don't let people throw you off with 
Romans 4 and Galatians 3. Here's another thing which is pretty bad. It's so bad that Calvinists or people who support lordship salvation, they will use Romans 4 and Galatians 3 added with James 2 to prove to you that, yes, you are saved by faith, not by works, but, there, but this faith is a faith that operates and shows works. Now, see, that's contradictory already. You stretch that far. You stretch that far. The simplest answer is divide it. If you divide it, then truth comes out more easily. Amen. It's that simple. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. Verse 7, And he said unto him, So God is speaking to Abram, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So God is speaking to Abram, Hey, uh, I am the Lord. I am the one that got you out of Ur of the Chaldees. So that's a verse that proves that Abram is from Ur of the Chaldees. Okay? That was his birthplace. He came from there. God brought him out of there to give thee this land to inherit it. The land that Abram is currently residing, Canaan, Canaan what they would call modern-day Palestine, which is actually incorrect. But I'm just going to say that, that way people can understand. But he is living in Canaan. That land is for him to inherit. That's what God said. Amen. And he said, Lord God, so Abram now is speaking back to the Lord. He's saying, God, or Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So Abram wants to know, how am I going to know that I can inherit it? So Abram, he wants a sign. He wants some kind of proof. Just like when people make some kind of deals or exchanges, they want some kind of substance or physical evidence, right? That's why back then we'll use solid substances, something precious like uh, gold. But now it deteriorates to a point where now it's like paper. And it deteriorates to a point that it's invisible now. It's in a, in a different realm. It's not in the physical world anymore. It's called virtual realm. So now it's in an invisible plane. So now that's why the economy's falling apart. So bad that now you're basing it on something invisible, not something physical substance, especially something precious. That proves that it has worth and value. And that's why the economy can go on. But I'm not going to get into that, okay? Uh, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theory or the Federal Bank, Rockefellers, and stuff like that, all right? All right, but uh, it is interesting if you do study the Vatican, though, all right? If you, I'll just say this as a side note, okay? I just have to say this. So get a, get a book by Avro Manhattan called Vatican Billions, uh, and that is the best book ever. It's by, a, a, it's by a guy who's not even a safe Christian, to my knowledge. He works for the news media. He's a journalist. And he was researching during 1900s. And during that time, he was researching heavily the Vatican. It's called Avro Manhattan Vatican Billions from the space, um, from, I think it says from the Dark Ages to the Space Age. So he goes through the entire history of the Vatican and shows the wealth of the popes even up to today. It's absolutely amazing. But uh, you have to find his original edition because uh, I can't find it anymore. But it's based on his original edition. Now it's abridged or revised. Uh, yeah. His original edition is way more detailed. But I think he got a lot of... My guess is he got a lot of heat on that. So he had to retract a lot of things. But if you look at that, he documents everything. And it's, it's very, very alarming. Like who controls the bank, so to speak. And some people, when they dig down the rabbit hole, they'll go back to, uh, they'll go to Rockefellers, J.P. Morgan, they'll go to the Federal Reserve, or even the Rothschilds. But if you look at all these guys, they trace, you'll still find a trace to the Vatican. Uh, Chase, where it comes from Morgan, the Rockefellers, these guys, they go back to the round table. And in the round table, Cecil Rhodes, when he started it, his position, which was first place high ranking, he dubbed himself as the superior general or Jesuit general. That's the Vatican's leading, uh, uh, leading core of the Jesuit ranks, actually, it, for some of you who didn't know. A second thing is concerning about the Rothschilds. You didn't know this, but they are given the title guardians of the Vatican's treasury. See, so it's all connected to Vatican. Okay, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole anymore, all right? That's, a, that's a, all those different videos and documentations I pulled out. I'm not going to 
do a thorough detail on that, pulling up documents, going step by step. I, we got to go verse by verse Bible study. Where did I get off on Rothschild by <laughs> verse 8, okay? That's some verse by verse Bible study. All right, verse 9. And he said unto him, so God, he wants substance and worth, uh, so he's going to prove it. So God says to Abram, take me in a uh, heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So notice right here that God is speaking to Abram that, okay, so this will be the sign that I will prove it. So then he takes out a heifer, she-goat, ram, turtle dove, and young pigeon. And if you study in your Bible, this matches a lot with the Levitical sacrifices. And it's, a ra it's not just one type, it's a r whole range of Levitical sacrifices. You see turtle dove, young pigeon, uh, with the purification. Ram as, a, I think, a scapegoat offering, as a covering for sins. And then the other two animals you can see as considered as... Uh, celebratory offerings or worship offerings or even sin offerings. So you can see that God, he gave a thorough sign to Abram that will cover pretty much a whole range of Levitical sacrifices. Amen. When a person makes a sacrifice to God, it's very strong that God would put an oath or covenant to it. And he'll put mark it as part of the Mosaic law. So, this covenant is so strong that in verse 9, God covers a, not just one type of sacrifice, but a range of sacrifices. That's important to understand. And all you have to do is read the book of Leviticus, and then you'll see those animals mentioned. So, all you have to do is compare it with the book of Leviticus. Now, look at verse 10. Notice that uh, if you don't believe in rightly dividing, uh, Abram believed in rightly dividing. He is a dispensationalist. And he took unto him all these, so Abram took all these animals and divided them in the midst. So in the midst of this, see, he decided to, with all this portion all piled up together, in the midst, in the middle of this, he started to divide it. That's the idea. So what did he do? And laid each piece one against another. The idea is he was laying down each piece and each piece is one against the other. See that? So, side by side. And then notice right here, but the birds divided he not. However, the birds he didn't divide. He just uh, combined them all together. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So, obviously, there are vultures or other types of predatory birds who wanted to feast upon the carcasses, but Abram, he started to drive them out. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. So the sun was going down right here. You'll notice that from this picture, it's going down. And then Abram, he falls into a deep sleep. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. So all of a sudden, while he was sleeping, it was as if great darkness fell on him. Uh, lo and behold, that's the idea, right? So what is this great darkness that fell on him? That means it's something ominous. It's going to be something dark that's going to come out. And there is a dark statement that comes out in verse 13. There's something ominous. There's something that's a prediction or a prophecy that's going to be unfortunate, so to speak, misfortune that will fall upon Abram. So that's a sign that's showing that. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land. So God's saying, know for surety, know for certain, right? That's the idea. That your seed, your children, are going to become strangers, foreigners, in a land that is not theirs, in a territory in a land that doesn't belong to them, and shall serve them. They're going to serve these foreigners as well. And they shall afflict them 400 years. So, these Gentiles, these non-Jews, so to speak, are going to afflict and persecute Abram's children, or Jews, for about 400 years. Now, before I continue on in this passage, this verse is very powerful, where notice that God told him at verse 9 through 11 that, okay, 
uh, I made a covenant with you. Now, he gave a covenant to Abram, right? When he made a covenant to Abram about his seed, that's going to be numerous, and it's going to be irrefutable. He mentioned, which is very powerful, which is a huge blessing, he says, okay, I'm going to really confirm this. You want a sign? And he did two things. Two things you can find here that proves the Abrahamic covenant very strongly and powerfully. That's why you can't get rid of the Jews, all right? When God says you are going to inherit this land, that's what uh, Abraham pointed out at verse 8, right? You are going to get this land grant, and he was talking about the physical Jews when he... And then we obviously saw the spiritual Christians are able to accompany that. That's like a tag along. But the reason why the covenant is irrefutable about the Jews that they will inherit the land and Abraham's physical children as found at Genesis 12, Genesis 15 is based on one, the Levitical, it covered the whole range of Levitical sacrifices, one. The second thing is Abram didn't follow a condition. In fact, he was so anti-Calvinist uh, where, uh, well, basically right here, he was totally anti-covenant theology. There was absolutely no condition involved. There was no even ability involved of Abram's part. He just fell asleep. And God said, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> so notice that Abram, he didn't even have to be awake when God gave the promise. He can just fall dead asleep and God's like, I'm, it's going to happen anyway. So that's a powerful passage right here that, look, there is no way you can prove replacement theology. There is no conditions that the Jews have to base it upon. They can just fall asleep for all I care and God's going to make it happen. Yeah, that's a very powerful passage. Abram didn't have to do anything. All he had to do is just fall asleep and God's like, well, it's going to happen anyway. Now, at verse 13 is a complicated passage. I already explained that passage. So the idea, you could probably guess how that, uh, how that prophecy, that, uh, that prophecy of misfortune will be fulfilled in the future. Basically, you can think about the Jews in the nation of Egypt, right? In the land of Egypt. So they're going to be afflicted. They're going to be persecuted. So that's Abram's, Abram's children later on who's going to be afflicted and persecuted. But there is a problem. If you look at all historical accounts, there is no doubt about it. When you look at all historical accounts, that the Jews, let's see right here, I think I'll use uh, blue, that the nation of Israel... When they are in the land of Egypt, so let's point this out as the nation of Israel, the Jews, that their affliction goes for only 215 years, approximately, give or take. That's how long they were in Egypt. If you go up to 400, that, the math is really, really off. There's no way you can squeeze that timeline. So Jews is maximum or approximately 215 years. But let me show you a bigger problem. Go to Exodus 12. Here's a bigger problem. Exodus 12. Let's prove the Bible wrong. See, I told you your Bible has mistakes. You can't believe that book even if you wanted to. All right, go to Exodus chapter 12. Notice at verse 41, Exodus chapter 12, verse 41, we've got a huge issue right here. Seems like there's a lot of errors in the Bible. So the darkness comes out and the Lord is speaking to him out of the darkness here. And, he, and the Lord, I guess because uh, God is not really omniscient, he can't tell time well enough that he said, it's going to be 400 years. But no, history proved the God of your Bible wrong. So it's not 400 years. But wait, your God is so incompetent, probably, that he says 430 years. Now look at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Verse 41. And it came to pass at the end, so this is the end of their uh, bondage and slavery, the Jews, of the 430 years, even the self-same day it came to pass, 
that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Whoa, so they got out of Egypt after 430 years. So the God of the Bible is incompetent and wrong, and that's why you should be an atheist. Now, one, okay, one, this is a very simple argument against atheism. Even uh, if you have to prove the Bible wrong by just numbers, then that shows how pathetic and desperate you are, actually. Because throughout, it is a common knowledge, if you go back through historical timelines and you dig up historical evidences, there are historical writers and evidence that will prove the existence of Alexander the Great, that will prove that the civilization of Babylon existed. But guess what? They're, when they calculate years or age, they might be off a couple of years or they might have some contradictions, all right? But that does not invalidate historical evidence that Babylonia uh, existed and as well as Alexander the Great, Grecian Empire, Assyrian Empire, etc. You don't know uh, historical archaeology that well, all right? It baffles my mind, especially when a PhD scholar goes for the numbers to prove your Bible wrong. All right? Let's even take it, let's deny uh, inerrancy in the Bible, okay? Even if we deny inerrancy of the Bible and say that there are contradictions in the Scripture, look, just because uh, human writers, they can be wrong about the years and the dates, don't mean that they're wrong about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and tons of other historical evidences. A person, uh, the resurrection of Christ is way more than evidence of history as well as basically deity, because no man can raise himself from the dead unless he's God. So because there's too many historical evidences pointing that out, especially historical writers confirming that, with the tons of prophecies that is mathematically impossible, too many historical scientific and uh, evidential accounts, especially with Jesus Christ. There's too many, e there's way too much evidence right here that just because historical writers are off by a couple of years doesn't mean they're wrong. So until you invalidate and debunk impossible cases, not minuscule cases like years, that's minuscule. You don't disprove Christianity by you are off by five years because scientists have been off by a couple of years too. You still believe in evolution, even though they can't pinpoint the date out to you. You know that? They keep changing dates, all right? Yet you still believe in it. So that's very minuscule. You can't throw off a belief or a hardcore doctrine based on years or numbers. If you want to attack a hardcore belief, you got you to attack the main beliefs, the hardcore beliefs, not years. Why do I believe the Bible is true? Because of, it said 400 years. Like that will convince an atheist. You know why I believe the Bible is true? Because there's way too much prophecy, historical evidence, scientific accounts, especially the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's way more than evidence right there. But until you can disprove those things, basically the resurrection of Christ, then you can pretty much throw off everything. You got to attack the main beliefs, hardcore beliefs, not minuscule ones. All right, minuscule ones are... Uh, it's not good enough. That's the same thing with evolution. How do I disprove evolution? Not by, oh, you said billions of years, but I can prove it's millions of years. That don't disprove evolution. I have to attack their main beliefs, their hardcore beliefs. So like, uh, such as, for example, the ancient account and age of the universe. Not just years, but the ancient account of it with a young earth or young universe age. A second one is fossil evidence. A third one is concerning about their uh, microevolution, macroevolution. So sp uh, spontaneous, uh, uh, what do they call it? I forgot. But basically, you have to disprove all these accounts from them. Then you can disprove evolution. Not by, you are off by a thousand years. This is off by how many years? And evolutionists are off by how many years? <laughs> Wow, you disproved the Bible, okay? Good for you, man. And you're a scholar? You, you, you shame yourself. Now, why do I attack? Why do I criticize so hard? The people that I criticize so hard is not, uh, even though I preach against sin and sinners who commit really bad sins, I don't go as strong against them compared to scholars. The reason why is scholars are totally dishonest. They're very dishonest. They don't really play a fair game. They go by their upbringing, what they are taught by their own bias. If they were truly honest in their scholarship, they would have caught that. All right?
All right, now anyways, but that's not how I can reconcile this argument, all right? I can do that and move on, but I'm not going to do that. I will even reconcile the dates for you, all right? That's what Bible believers do. We'll reconcile the dates. Scientists and evolutionists are still trying to figure out how to reconcile the dates. <laughs> they argue with each other. There are some fossils that transition too fast that you got famous ones like Stephen Jay Gould who argued that, you know, from one different type of a species or animal, they can jump the evolution timeline and turn into a totally uh, different animal. They argue that because there's a jump in fossil evidence, so they don't know how to explain that. And then, but majority still go by, uh, majority still go by microevolution that basically there's a mixture of spontaneous incidents of evolution combined with natural selection. They still argue ma uh, majority that way. But Stephen Jay Gould, who majored in paleontology, the fossils, he sees too much of a gap of a timeline. So he argues more of spontaneous jumps. He goes more by the mutation process, not natural selection of bit by bit, because the fossil evidence is just unexplainable right there. So guess what? See, scientists still debate and fuss each other. Yeah. And guess what? They don't have a problem still believing in evolution. We Christians, we already reconciled the answer for you. And you know what? We still believe in Christianity. <laughs> okay. So let's reconcile this. This is pretty simple. In Genesis 15, and by the way, the uh, majority of denominations will agree with this interpretation too, believe it or not. The idea is that the verse says, the sea shall be a stranger uh, in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. God, when he's speaking right here, he's looking, uh, our God, you have to understand, this is evidence. Our God, he doesn't concentrate one specific timeline. Man does. Man has to concentrate on specific timelines because we're built on time. But God, he is I am that I am. Amen. So when he speaks, he can include three different timelines in one statement, you have to understand. Amen. Why? Because God is everywhere present tense no matter which timeline. We, we have to divide the timelines. That's why we have to have dispensationalism understand God's dealings and workings because all of us are ranged in different time periods but God he can jump anywhere and when he states something he can include three different timelines so right here God is speaking generally holistically because he's seeing a whole bunch of timelines here basically the general idea is that the Jews are going to be strangers in the land of Gentiles that's the idea it's not specifically Jews moving down to Egypt and they sojourn there for 400 years. No, God is saying that their sojourning and being strangers is general, more holistically speaking. That's what he's talking about here, that they're going to be sojourners for about 400 years in a strange land. And the evidence is Genesis 17. Combine that and look at Exodus 12 again. Exodus 12 and Genesis 17. In Exodus 12, verse 41, it says, uh, we pointed out and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, right? All right, what's the context of verse 40? Now the what? Sojourning, all right? The sojourning part of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. So notice right here that God is speaking holistically of the Jews, their sojourning. He does point out about who dwelt in Egypt, but he's talking about the Jews right there, the group, the nation of Israel, because currently they're living in Egypt. In fact, some modern versions, this is interesting. If you look at, uh, there are uh, ancient sources and different accounts that will mention its uh, the Jews lived in Canaan and Egypt, actually. They'll mention that out. But here the King James Bible and uh, even other different versions of the Bible will not be incorrect here because it's talking about the Jews who are right now, obviously, they're living in Egypt, so that's correct. But the, that's not the main attention. The main attention is, the main subject is what? Sojourning. See, that's the subject. Who dwelled in Egypt, that's just inclusive as part of the sentence. It's only included as a part of it. But the main subject is sojourning. 
The sojourning, see, of the children of Israel would be what? 430 years. That's their sojourning. Look at Genesis 17. Abraham, he, he did not inherit Canaan yet. He was sojourning. He was a stranger. Remember, Abraham was speaking to God. Don't forget the context of Genesis 15. Lord, when will I know that I will inherit this land? See, that's the main subject right here. So God is talking about that main subject, about his sojourning. But obviously in his sojourning, he has to include Egypt in there as well. Why? Because the Jews, they never owned and inherited the land yet all that time. They were sojourning in Canaan and Egypt. And it's not just those two places. They were wandering in the wilderness too. See? For 40 years. But anyways, let's look at Genesis 17. This is God repeating the covenant. So it's going to be the same thing as Genesis 15. Okay? It's going to be the same subject as Genesis 15. And notice what God said at verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land, see that? Wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan. Isn't that similar with what God said at verse Genesis 15, 13? 15, 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And then verse 8 of Genesis 15, 8, Inherit the land, Canaan. See, it's the same idea. And by the way, God is repeating his covenant. If you look at Genesis 17, 1 through 8, see, God is repeating his covenant to Abraham, to Abram. So that's matching with Genesis 15. God is what? It's talking about his covenant to Abram. See that? The whole idea is about sojourning, and that included Canaan. It's not just Egypt. Egypt is a small part of the subject. The more important subject was actually Canaan, believe it or not, because that's what Abraham's focus was on, or Abram, excuse me. He wasn't named Abram, Abraham yet. Anyway, so that's where we get the 430 years. But then why, how are we going to explain the 400 years, right? The 400 years is, if you look at verse 13, notice that the 430 years is the sojourning at Exodus 12, okay? The 400 years is not the sojourning. It says right here in verse 13, and they shall afflict them what? 400 years. They, referring to the non-Jews, Gentiles, right? like Canaan, like Egypt, like other Gentiles, God is looking holistically, right? That the Gentiles will afflict the Jews for 400 years. You know when that started? This is how God sees it starting. Go to Galatians. 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 Galatians chapter... Four, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Notice at verse 28, verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That's referring to Abram's seed, right? So what about Abram's seed? But as then, he that was born after the flesh, that's Ishmael, persecuted him, that's Abram's seed, Isaac, that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. See, God considers that as the affliction, the persecution of his seed, of his people. Verse 30, nevertheless, nevertheless what saith the Scripture, cast out the bondwoman and her son, that's Hagar and Ishmael, because uh, Ishmael persecuted uh, the Jews, or Isaac, as God saw it as. So notice that God is seeing holistically here as the seed of Abram, and he started the affliction, what? With Ishmael. So the idea is this. Now the timeline is matching, and then we'll close it right here, okay? The timeline is matching. So when we begin Abram's sojourning, I think the King James Bible has this as a spelling. 
So then the time gap right here is about uh, 430 years up to the time where they get out of Egypt. And that's why if you look at the timeline of all the Jews before uh, the slavery in Egypt, the other half of the 215 years matches very well. And historians will agree with that. And generally, all Bible scholars also agree with that. So this gap makes sense. Abram, then, if he starts to sojourn, the Bible shows that Genesis 12, he was 75 years, right? Okay, it said it started when Ishmael persecuted Isaac. When Ishmael persecuted Isaac, that would be the 400 years then right here, okay? If this is the 400 years, then there's a gap here of 30 years, right? Wow. So then the gap here would be, that's why I say it would be complicated, that's why I have to draw it out, all right? The gap here would obviously be 30 years, which fits in comfortably, but it seems to not mathematically add up. Why? Because when Abraham, uh, Abraham that time, that's his name, gave birth to Isaac, where Ishmael can persecute Isaac, Isaac he was 100 years old, okay? Abraham was 100 years old. Wait, that's uh, 25 years. See that? That doesn't add up. You've got to put uh, 30 years, right? No, the, it makes sense. The Bible says when Ishmael started his persecution of Isaac, he was grown and weaned. So you can put five years when he was five years old that time. That fits well. Then that equals 30 to a T. Wow, that's more accurate than eight, any radiocarbon dating of evolution. They give it or take a couple thousand years off, and it's approximately accurate. God goes to a T. Now, I don't know why you can't be a Christian after that, all right? <laughs> all right. Heavenly Father, uh, I want to thank you so much for the truth of your word. And uh, what an amazing book. It is accurate to a T, Lord. It is such a perfect book. We thank you so much for the learning of your scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.